All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ABCs of Braille Basics for Beginners. Before we get started, as with all online conferences, please follow good etiquette by keeping yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, this is the bottom left corner of your iPhone screen, Alt-A on a PC and Option-A on a Mac. Using the raise hand option when you have a question, double tap on your name in the participants list on an iPhone or go into the more tab and find uh, the raise hand there. Alt Y on a PC and option Y on a Mac. Please save the use of the chat feature for urgent questions and comments. And the information part of this session will be recorded and later posted on the Braille Literacy Canada YouTube channel. We will stop the recording prior to the question and answer period. The World Braille Day planning organizations acknowledge the historic, historical oppression of land cultures and original peoples in what we now know as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land and will continue to honour the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to Indigenous nations and peoples. Please take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which you live, work and play. Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, CNIB Braille Beyond Print, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, Alternate Education Resources Ontario, the Centre for Equitable Library Access, and the Provincial Resource Centre for the Visually Impaired have had a lot of fun working together and are pleased to deliver this series of events during the month of January in celebration of World Braille Day. Our pre presenters today are Kim Kilpatrick of CCB, Daphne Hitchcock of BLC, Natalie Marcinello, also from BLC, Juana from CELA, and Shelly Ann from CCB. And uh, I believe, Kim, I'll let you take it from here. Yes, and you can hear me all right. I'm yes. muted and videoed on. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rayan, and welcome everybody to this uh, wonderful presentation all about the ABCs of Braille. We're going to start off, um, I'm going to tell you the format here, we're going to start off with talking about what Braille is, for those of you who don't know, and we're going to talk about the practical uses of learning Braille as adults. Then we're going to have a chat for, uh, with an adult Braille user and, and others about uh, some questions about Braille. And then we are going to have resources, uh, talk about some resources and a Q&A. And we should be finished around 2.30 Eastern, so 11.30 Pacific and whatever time zone you're in. Um, we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to Daphne Hitchcock, who's the president of, of BLC, to go through the very basics of what Braille is and, and how it works. Great. Thanks, Kim. Um, well, welcome everyone to this presentation. This is our first one for um, celebrating World Braille Day during the month of January. So welcome and thank you for joining us. So what is Braille? Well, Braille is a tactile code and that allows people with limited or no vision to read by touch. The design of the Braille cell is such that it fits just perfectly underneath a fingertip. And typically when a reader uh, is reading Braille, they're using both hands for reading with their index fingers used for the actual Braille character discrimination. And the, the other fingers as either a line guide, so the Braille line guide, or just having providing some orientation on the page itself. Um, next slide, please. What is a Braille cell? So that's sort of a basic thing. The Braille cell is a unit of six dots and each letter or character in the Braille code is based on a combination or arrangement of those dots. So the raised dot array is set in two parallel columns with each column having just six dots. And for ease of explanation, the dots have a numbered position 
in the Braille cell. So um, I have a photo here that shows um, a six cup muffin tin. And in each little cup of the muffin tin, there are six numbered tennis balls. The muffin tin is placed in a portrait mode. So the long edge of the sides, um, the long edges are on the sides, short ends, top and bottom. And looking at this muffin tin, dot one is in the top left hand corner of the muffin tin. And dot two, a tennis ball and dot in, is in the middle left side of the uh, muffin tin. And dot three or the third tennis ball is in the lower left-hand side of the muffin tin. Four, five, and six start at the top right, middle right, and bottom right of for dot six. So when we look at this muffin tin, it is representing a braille cell. Next slide, please. These are mighty dots and they are dynamic and they do double duty, well, triple duty and quadruple duty. These are incredible, incredible. Gotta love braille. When all six dots are raised, we call this a full cell or a braille cell. And using a combination of these dots, we can create a character that represents either a letter, a number, punctuation, or even a whole word or a part of a word. All the conventions of print can be represented with this dot matrix. Amazing. I mean, it's really a, a tremendous thing. But one thing to really note is that Braille is not a language and that's a common misconception for people that they think, oh, I'm learning a new language. Well, no, what you're learning is a code and it's just such an awesome code. And although we're discussing English Braille today, they, these same six dots are used when representing other languages, such as French or Spanish or Japanese, Korean, lots of languages represented with these same six dots. And again, these dots go further and we can use them for representing computer code or even music, musical score. So it, they're amazing. So dynamic dots for sure. On to the next slide here. The first 10 letters of the alphabet, so we're thinking about letters A to J, these first 10 letters use the top half of the braille cell. So we're, let's go back to that muffin tin. We're thinking of the muffin tin and we're going to just talk about the four cups at the top part of the cell. The four dots on the top part of the cell would be dots one and two on the left and four and five on the right. So the first 10 letters are a combination of those those uh, four, four, four cells or four dots at the top of the muffin tin. The next slide shows uh, the letters K to T, which are the next 10 letters of the alphabet. And the letters K to T use again, the top half of the braille cell. So those four dots that I just talked about. And additionally, they add in dot three. So that would be the lower dot on the left hand side. So that's kind of a cool thing. Once you've learned the first 10 letters of the alphabet, when you go to learn the next 10, you're only adding in a single extra dot to those, those first 10. So let's go on to the last slide here about the alphabet, letters U to Z, add in dot six. So dot six, if you remember, is the dot that is in the lower right position of the braille cell. Now there's one little letter that doesn't follow the rules completely and that is letter W and the reason for that is W was not part of the French alphabet at the time that our, our man uh, Mr. Louis Braille developed this amazing code and so it doesn't follow the same pattern but let's let me explain this a little bit further. We'll go a little step on to the next slide and I'll try to set this up a little more logically for you. Braille is very logical and it, it definitely does follow patterns. So for instance, we can start by making the letter A by taking a tennis ball 
and we could pop it into the upper left hand position Hello. of a muffin tin. So we pop our, our tennis ball into the upper left hand top position of that muffin tin. And then we can take another tennis ball yeah, and so. we can put it in dot three. And that makes letter K. So letter K is taking your tennis ball and putting it in dot three. So then, then we can take sessions. another tennis ball and, and drop it into dot six. And we've jumped over and made letter U. So you can see that there's a pattern that follows through. On to the next slide. I'll explain this a little bit further. Again, the pattern, we, we have letter B, which is dots one and two on the left side. And now, remember, we're going to jump through to the 11th letter of the alphabet. We draw, drop in dot three in the lower uh, left-hand side. That makes our letter L. And then we're going to go to those last six letters of the alphabet, and we're going to put in a braille cell, a braille dot into the sixth position, and that will make our letter V. Uh, I'll explain it one more time. Going into the next slide, we go. We have letter C using dots one and four. That are the two top dots in the braille cell. Then we add in dot three. And that changes our letter C to a letter M. And then we add in dot six, and that changes our letter M to letter X. So as you can see, there is a pattern. So a Braille can look daunting, but once you get into it and you start finding these patterns, it starts to make sense. One thing that is really helpful is to practice the arrangement of these dots using things that you might have around the house. Now, I was demonstrating a muffin tin with tennis balls. Another thing that can be used is half an egg carton with ping pong balls in it. And I'm holding up that up to the screen. I have ping pong balls on one side of the cell and I use poker chips in the other side of the cell. So uh, not you, you would choose something that you would want to have throughout. So either all poker chips or all ping pong balls. And most of us have um, a cartons kicking around. So just cut one in half and bingo, you've got a braille cell there with a six dot matrix. So on to the next slide, please. We have tools. Once we've been practicing with the arrangement of these dots, we have tools that we can actually use to create Braille. And I have three uh, images on this screen. The first image is of a slate and stylus. So a slate is, it can be plastic or a metal um, fo uh, form that it, a frame at least that is used to actually um, insert paper into the frame and using a stylus, which is a, a pointed instrument you can use to create your braille dots. Uh, the next image shows a Dymo braille labeler. It also is a handheld tool and it has a, a rotating wheel on it that lines up um, to when you press the handle on the labeler, it will create the dot array onto a plastic uh, self-adhesive tape. And you can use that for labeling things in and around your house. And the last thing that I have is a, a photo of a Perkins Brailler. So this is much a larger tool. It sits on a table. It has um, a six key entry for the Braille dots. And to operate this piece of machinery, you insert paper and it is uh, pressing the keys in the arrangement to make the Braille dot matrix um, that you can create Braille. So those are some basic tools that are used to use Braille. Slate and Stylus and the Dymo Brailler are, are really good ones to start with because they're relatively inexpensive and pretty easy to figure your way around. Um, on to the next slide, please. So getting started with Braille can be a, a big thing. And we, we really, um, 
appreciate that. And Braille Literacy Canada uh, recognizes that learning Braille as an adult or an older adult, a senior, can be a challenge. So we have created an amazing free program called Braille Zoomers. And this is a monthly virtual peer support group that is a get together for adults and, and uh, older adult senior Braille learners. Um, the new Braille Zoomers, or excuse me, new Braille Zoomers who, um, who have been participating can even apply for a starter kit of some really cool, amazing things to help them start their Braille journey. And some of the items actually would be great in libraries as well, but some of these items that are in the kit are uh, a, a good book that is called Just Enough to Know Better, which is distributed from National Braille Press, a slate and stylus, which is a basic tool that we had a photo of, uh, the Dymo Braille Labeler, again, I showed you that, and other things such as Braille playing cards and uh, Braille flashcards. So for information about this Braille Zoomer kit, you can email us at info at blclbc.ca. So that's info, I-N-F-O, at blc lbcca And this last slide that I'll show you um, on this pack is a photo of the Braille Zoomer kit and it shows, a, shows in the photo the labeler, playing cards, flash cards, slate and stylus, some Braille eraser, some Braille paper, and um, a symbols book that shows um, the symbols that are used to represent, we represent um, in Braille and the book, Just Enough to Know Better. So without any further ado, I am going to turn this over to uh, Natalie and she's gonna to talk to you about just the importance of Braille and making it applicable in your home. Go ahead, Natalie. Thank you, Daphne. That was a really good introduction and background. And hello, everyone. So I will now be talking a little bit about what it's like to learn Braille as an adult, what you can expect, and some tips and strategies you can use to empower yourself on your journey. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is why you might want to learn Braille as an adult. So maybe you're experiencing sight loss and you're wondering, is this something I should do? Uh, maybe it's too much of a time investment. And so my advice would be to flip that question around if you're wondering, should I learn Braille? Um, and ask yourself, should we learn or use print? So. Think about the role that print played in your life before vision loss. And Braille can help to fill those gaps by allowing you to do all those same things you did before with print. And a different way that maybe you can think about this question is to think about what you're no longer able to do since experiencing your sight loss. So is there something, a hobby or an activity you've had to abandon or a new hobby you'd like to take on since vision loss? And maybe Braille would be a good way to help you do that. I also list here a few ideas, a few other examples for how you can use Braille in your life after um, a visual impairment. So for example, identifying household items, especially for things around the home that feel the same, like maybe you have two cans of soup that feel exactly the same and you just want a label to easily identify them by touch. And so this is a really great way, even if you have some low vision, maybe you don't wanna to have to go look for your magnifier or put the item very close to your face. And this can be a much quicker way to figure out what it is that you found. So you can also use Braille to take notes for yourself. So this is really handy. You can make notes, uh, a list of phone numbers, for example, a grocery list. You can take messages when you uh, get a phone call or just other notes for yourself, route instructions. So if you're going on an O&M lesson or, or a new route that's not so familiar to you, maybe you wanna take those with you. And that's really helpful because it's very portable. You can make notes for yourself using the Brailler that Daphne mentioned. 
and then just put that in your purse or your bag or your pocket and quickly access your notes. And then um, even if you have low vision, you have access to the, those notes, even if the lighting is poor wherever you are. You can also use Braille to play games with sighted family members and friends and with others who are blind. There are lots of places where you can purchase Braille board games, Braille playing cards, bingo. And so that can be really helpful because again, if you think about a board game, it can be really hard sometimes with low vision if you have to get really close to the board to be able to read uh, what's there. And then also reading books to children and grandchildren. So you can purchase or borrow uh, print braille books, um, including from the libraries that we have represented here today. And these are books that have both print and braille. So these are things that you can enjoy together. Next slide, please. You can also read and disconnect. So even sighted people sometimes just want to get away from technology, right? So you might love your iPad, but sometimes you just want the scent and the feel of a real book. And so Braille allows you to do that, even, um, even if you're also using technology in other ways. I also want to point out for, for those of you who are still working or who are students, you can use Braille um, at school and at work. So a really good example of this is if you're editing a document at work or at school, with Braille, you have access to spelling and punctuation. And these are things that you might otherwise miss if you're just listening to a text. In the same way, if you're thinking about learn or using Braille at work, for example, it can be a really great way to access other types of information that are harder to understand through audio. If you think of an image like a map or a math equation, things that are a bit more where you really want to be able to understand the, the way things are laid out on the page, Braille can be very helpful. Um, and then another example for when you're at work at, or at school is to access your presentation notes, which is what I'm doing today. I have all my slides in Braille and I could easily access those without having to put the page up to my face to try to read that visually. Next slide, please. So in thinking about um, different strategies or advice, I thought about the fact that Braille is really a symbol of empowerment. So I'm playing on the idea of the six dots. And so I have six um, tips, six examples to empower you um, as you begin your Braille journey. So the first is let the light in. And what I mean by that is learn about Braille, right? So um, one uh, aspect of this is that you might feel really intimidated at first because you see all those dots and you're wondering, how am I ever going to learn this? And Daphne um, explained really well the logic of the Braille code. It's actually a lot more logical than print, right? There's no reason why an A looks like an A in print, but there's a logic in Braille so that when you learn the first 10 letters, you then have all that you need to learn the rest of the alphabet, and that could really help you um, if you're feeling in, um, intimidated. But there are other bumps and roadblocks that you might encounter along the way, and not the good bumps, not the Braille bumps, but misconceptions about Braille that might be maybe preventing you from thinking about Braille. And I list a few of, the, of these here on the slide. So one really common one is that Braille is only for people who are totally blind. And that's untrue. We've talked about if you have low vision, it often really depends, right? It depends on the lighting and the contrast and the size of what you're reading. If you're in front of an audience or, you know, if you're, maybe your eyes get tired at a certain point of the day. And so having that option is really helpful. And there are many people who use Braille who have low vision. Another really common misconception is that Braille is only for people who read a lot, like who read novels. And we've talked about that that's untrue as well, because you can use Braille to read um, short, you know, labels in your home or short notes. And so you can really 
customize Braille in whatever way works for you. Daphne mentioned older adults, and there's a really common misconception that maybe you're too old to learn Braille. And that is definitely untrue. We know a lot of older adults who are using Braille, and that journey might look different to you, but um, it is certainly possible uh, for many people. And then the final misconception is that technology replaces the need for Braille. And so here I'd like to just kind of add to what Daphne was talking about um, a, lit a little later on, and I'll show you some technology that you can use to actually increase your access to Braille. So we'll move to the next slide. As you're learning more about Braille, you should learn about where you could learn Braille because it's always better when you have support and you're not learning alone. So here I list some examples of where you can learn Braille in Canada. We have Vision Loss Rehab Canada, which has an office in every province. For those of you who are in British Columbia, there's a Pacific Training Center for the Blind. We have a variety of different rehabilitation centers in Quebec for both English and French speaking Canadians. And then for those of you who like learning at a distance, we have Hadley, which will send you materials to your home that you can learn on your own. And you could do this in combination with other types of training, like with Vision Loss Rehab Canada, for example. So it's certainly not an either or. Next slide. So my second advice, dot two, is harness technology. So I think what I'll do here is I'll switch my camera. OK, are we seeing my Braille display here? Yes. OK, perfect. So here we have a Braille display. And these are devices that you can connect to your computer or to your smartphone and you have instant access to Braille. And so you might see that there is Braille um, on the device and that's showing what's on the screen visually on your computer or your smartphone. And there are buttons that I can use to forward the Braille. And as you do that, the line refreshes um, and you see more information on the screen. So it's really dynamic and very cool. They come in different sizes. So this is a very portable one. You can get larger ones and you can get some that have typing keys to type in Braille and some that do not. Okay, so I'm just switching back to my other camera and we'll move on to the next slide. And I know I'm sharing a lot of information, but I'm, we're all very happy to answer questions afterwards. Third, so dot three, get to know others. You can learn a lot from lifelong Braille readers about how you can use Braille in your life. And you can also learn a lot from fellow Braille learners, adult Braille learners, because sometimes you might feel alone. You know, am I the only one struggling with this letter? Or, you know, maybe you'll be able to share a really helpful tip with someone else. And so that's really helpful. Daphne mentioned Braille Zoomers, which is a virtual peer support program that BLC offers. Um, I know that the Canadian Council of the Blind has a really great program called Getting Together with Technology, which um, where people can meet virtually and share tips and advice about Braille and lots of other devices as well. If you search for Braille on Facebook, you'll find a lot of really, really cool groups of Braille users and family members where you can ask questions. And I also list here a podcast called Braillist Foundation, where you can learn lots of great stuff about Braille um, from the United Kingdom um, that really is hosted by Braille users. We'll move to the next slide. Dot four, create a tactile and Braille rich environment. So we, you wanna really brush up on your tactile skills because as someone who was sighted before, you probably didn't really think too much about your sense of touch. So you wanna develop those skills. And if you think about print, print is all around you. So you're unconsciously learning from the time you're born all about how print works. You wanna give yourself that same opportunity to find Braille all around you. So you can place tactile markers on appliances. So for example, just a dot 
on your microwave so that you can just develop that sense of touch to find a button on the microwave. You can also use Braille labels um, on cans of soup, like I mentioned. And you don't need to wait until you know the whole Braille code. If you learn, for example, A and B, you can put A on the shampoo and B on the conditioner or use whatever technique works for you uh, right away to start developing that sense of touch and using Braille in really fun ways. We'll move on to the next slide, please. Find meaningful ways to apply Braille to your life. So Daphne mentioned Braille is not a language, but like a language or like anything you're learning, you want to practice it every day so that you're really giving yourself a chance um, to become comfortable. But it shouldn't be work. It should be fun. And so I list some ways here that you can do that. You can find 10 minutes a day to just read something in Braille. You can practice identifying things with Braille labels in your home. You can play Braille bingo or Braille playing cards with family members. Again, that's that counts as practicing. I do know lots of adult Braille learners who like to keep a Braille journal. So maybe you wanna write a few sentences in Braille and then read that back to yourself because it's something familiar to you. So just find familiar texts um, that, that you know what words to expect to give yourself a bit of an extra boost to learn Braille. Next slide. We have reached dot six and it's an important one. It's have fun. Braille is all about what you want Braille to be. And literacy is above all else, enjoyment. And it should be fun. And make Braille work for you. Some of you may know that there's um, something called uncontracted Braille, which is just all the letters and numbers. And then there's contracted Braille, where there are symbols that represent an entire word to save space. You can choose whether you want to learn those contractions, those symbols that represent words. You don't need to. It's completely up to you. You can choose whether you just want to learn Braille for identifying elevator buttons and maybe your goals will change after you learn elevator buttons. You'll realize that you can read playing cards and then maybe you wanna do something more with it. So it's all about what you need. Final slide, please. So I'd like to also say a few words to those of you who are family members or who are, um, who maybe know others who are thinking about learning Braille as an adult or an older adult. Um, and how can you support them? Because Braille learners don't just exist in their own world, right? We have people all around us and there are lots of different ways that you can support and be a positive ally or support system for the people around you. And the first thing I would say is to really consider learning some Braille yourself. You don't have to commit to learning everything right away, right? Just learn the alphabet, learn the numbers. And that, that's really helpful because it shows that you're interested as well and you're taking the time, but it also gives you the opportunity to start using Braille to communicate with your colleague or your family member in a way that will be accessible to them. And that, that helps them on their journey, but it also gives them that independence back after vision loss. There are lots of adult Braille learners who they might feel really reluctant to learn Braille if they have low vision because they don't wanna use Braille in front of others who might not realize that they're struggling so much with their vision. And so finding ways to show through your comments, through your actions, um, that you see Braille as a positive symbol of independence will really help go a long way. I give some examples here of where you could learn Braille. So there's Hadley um, and they offer courses for sighted people to learn Braille as well. Daphne mentioned the book, Just Enough to Know Better from National Braille Press. That's a really great book because it, it really teaches you the basics of Braille pretty quickly. And it's really designed for 
family members, parents, anyone who's sighted who wants to learn Braille. BLC off also offers, we offer a number of different workshops that we gear towards family members and sighted teachers or colleagues. So definitely encourage you to visit our website, but also the website of others who are partners here today who also have lots of really great events that happen regularly. You can help create Braille labels. So Daphne mentioned the Dymo labeler. And what's great about the Dymo labeler is that there's also print on that device. And so you can, as a sighted person, help the, the Braille user in your life by creating Braille labels at home. You can also keep Braille items in the same place. So it can be a little frustrating when you're new to vision loss, you're not always sure where to find things in the home. And so it might seem like a small gesture, but even just keeping those Braille books in the same place, in a consistent place, or other Braille items, not putting other items on top of it so that the dots get squished, those are small gestures, but it goes a long way to making a positive Braille learning environment. You can create Braille greeting cards or Braille tags for gifts. That's a really, it's a playing on words here, but a personal touch, right? You're, you're making that gift accessible and I'm, I'm positive that it will be really well received. And then the final thing I would say is to just ask for Braille in your community. So even if you don't use Braille, you're a sighted person, when you go to a restaurant, ask if they have a Braille menu. Um, if you are traveling, ask if they have the information, the safety information in Braille, because what you're doing is you're, you're raising awareness that Braille is important. Um, and you're, you're just supporting that equal access to Braille. For those of you who are sighted and, and working, um, you might be interested to know that you can also make your business cards to have both print and Braille, and you can reach out to any of us today for information on where to do that. And again, that makes your card accessible, but it's also raising awareness to others. Um, you know, hey, this is what Braille is all about. So with that, I will stop talking and I will turn it over to uh, Shelly Ann, who will talk about her experience, and we're happy to continue the discussion from there. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Daphne. So um, as I said at the beginning, I'm Kim Kilpatrick. I'm, a, I'm the head of the Get Together with Technology program at CCD, which Natalie mentioned, and also on the board of BLC. So I'm going to ask uh, Shelley a few questions, but also I'd like, uh, you know, Natalie and Daphne and Ioana to feel free also to answer. So I may call on you as well um, because of your experience. Um, so I've been a lifelong Braille user. I learned Braille when I was six. Um, I'm also using a Braille display right now. I use a Braille display to host calls. I use Braille for everything every day. I use Braille with my phone, my computer, um, Braille screen input on my device, which we didn't really talk about that, but that's also a a free way of learning Braille is to use that. Um, but I'm going to ask Shelly, because Shelly's fairly new to learning Braille, even though she's had low vision all her life. So Shelly, what made you decide to learn Braille? Was there was there something that sort of tipped the balance uh, for you to learn Braille as an adult? <laughs> Thanks, Kim. And uh, happy World Braille Day and World Braille Month uh, to everybody. And I hope that you can hear me. Um, I think there was a couple of things that actually tipped the balance, if you will. Uh, one is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. All of a sudden, we had to stay home. So I had more time. And I thought, what am I going to do with this time? So I've always wanted to learn Braille because when I was a kid with low vision, the thinking was, don't teach kids with low vision any Braille because they're going to end up not using the residual site, which is rather odd, but there you go. So finally, I had the time. And also, all of a sudden, we then had the Braille Zoomers program, which I've been involved with ever since its outset. Um, and I've just so enjoyed that we meet on Zoom. And it's a great way to learn from peers 
Um, so those were two of the main things. And then through our community, I heard about um, Hadley um, and all their resources and as well as other resources that I haven't really dove into as much. Um, also, I, I'm not losing vision. It's really funny when I when I was telling people that I was learning Braille, the, the first thing they jumped to was, oh, no, are you losing sight? And I said, no, I, I just really want to learn it. Plus, I'd like to keep my brain active. It's important, especially as we age, to keep our brains as active as we can. And um, this was one way to do it, to learn to read in a different way. It's not a different language, as we've said. It's a different way. Um, and there's some, I guess, some practical things um, that we, we could use it for. Again, I, when Kim and I were on the radio on CKCU, I used to be very envious because she could read her notes uh, in Braille. And meanwhile, I was struggling with a piece of paper and uh, in front of a microphone, which was quite, quite awkward. Um, and um, I always wanted to use it to communicate with my friends and family who use Braille uh, by using it on greeting cards and other things, which we can talk about a bit later. Um, and then lastly, what I call elevator Braille. You know, it's very difficult sometimes when you're in an elevator to see those buttons, but if you can know um, enough Braille to get around, it's gonna help you a lot. Now, I think we can touch buttons again. So th those are my reasons. That's awesome. And Shelly did a beautiful thing for me at Christmas and she made me, she gave me a box of nine kinds of tea in different boxes and she put braille labels on all the outside and gave me a little map of which tea was what and uh that was like stuff like that is really appreciated by us as natalie kind of said about labeling things and giving things to your braille using friends and you said you gave a card to someone else that's a braille user and so you're actually you know helping us too so that's really great of you to work on your braille to give us braille so I think that's awesome that's an awesome reason um Natalie in in your teaching have you are there other reasons you have heard of for adults to learn braille some common reasons or uh, what are what are the kind of tipping points do you feel is, is there is there something else you want to say about that yeah am I unmuted yeah okay perfect yeah i mean you know i think there are a lot of different reasons um i think sometimes there are you know you might want to learn braille to prepare for the future maybe you do know your vision is going to change one day and you just want to prepare yourself um and that's really great because you know the earlier you learn the better but i think what we would all agree today is that you shouldn't just see it as something to help you in the future, right? Because even as you have vision now, you can start to think about ways that it can help you. And that's really important for learning because it's kind of like a language where if if you're only practicing it in in your, you know, with your instructor during your, your class, your session, um, and then you don't use it at home because you think it'll just be something for the future, um, it'll take a lot longer. So while it's really good to prepare for the future, I think it's also really important to find ways right away. And it could just be, again, playing games, labels, whatever it is that motivates you um, to start using it right away too. Awesome. Um, I did have one adult Braille learner recently who told me that uh, she was a very visual person and listening to audiobooks did not do it for her. Uh, she hated that. And she wanted to learn Braille to read books. So if you are really motivated in that way, maybe if you've been a visual learner too, that, that might be a reason and you might really jump in like she has really jumped into reading books. And she's not, not fast at it, but she's enjoying it much more than than audio books. So you never know. I guess, like you said, it's as individual as the person that is yeah, doing it. That's a really good point, Kim, because, you know, I'm thinking about and I know we're not alone in this. A lot of Braille users have said this is that um, when I was a student, I always preferred studying in Braille because it's something a little bit more active about reading in Braille. And actually, there's a lot of research that tells us this too, that it's often easier to, to remember and to understand what you're reading when you physically read it yourself rather than listening to it. 
And part of that is just, you know, because when we're listening to something, we could tune out and daydream and think about other things that when we're reading it ourselves, we're a lot more engaged. Um, and so it could be a lot more helpful to you if you need to remember something or really understand something. Um, and it just may be something that you enjoy more as well. Yeah. Um, here's the next question. So Shelly, what do you tell someone who's thinking about learning Braille? Like if you had advice for someone who, you know, is just starting that journey, what would be some tips you would give them for, for that? Uh, well, besides getting in touch with Braille Literacy Canada, <laughs> that'd be one of them for sure. That'd be one of my, one of my top uh, pieces of advice. But all kidding aside, um, the thing to keep in mind is go slow, be patient with yourself when you're learning Braille. And don't forget, especially for people who have had sight before and who would learn to read originally in print, it took you a long time to get to learn print. Uh, you had to sound out the letters and sound out words and learn about what different sounds each letter would make and how they worked in combination, just like Braille has a combination. Uh, it took you a while to learn to read and to write. It's going to take you a long time to learn how to use Braille as well. Um, you're going to have your own learning curve. Um, another thing I would tell people is, um, you know, use all the different resources that are out there. I tended to use um, the Braille Zoomers, um, also Hadley, and I know that there's other resources out there as well that I haven't really dove into, but um, those are sort of my two main ones. And uh, with the Braille Zoomers, of course, um, you're having a lot of fun. Earlier, uh, Natalie mentioned about having fun. Um, the Braille Zoomers is fun because it's a group of like-minded individuals uh, who are all doing the same as you. They may have different reasons for learning Braille. They may have different um, motivations, but they're all, it may be different stages, but they're all doing the same as you. And you can really learn from each other, from your peer group. Um, and um, the other thing that this is what I've experienced now, um, I have uh, done some of the Hadley courses and have been involved with uh, Braille Zoomers ever since its outset. Um, I think I've reached a little bit of a plateau. I've learned all my numbers and my letters in uncontracted uh, Braille. Pretty confident with those. Punctuation is still a bit of a struggle because there's so much of it. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of struggling with a little bit is um, when I read, when I'm reading Braille, I don't read fast enough and I lose track of the story, but I know that's going to come. And um, I have to get back to what I call my page a day. <laughs> habit where I try to read at least one page of Braille uh, a day and uh, where you know you can get Braille that you you know very very easy to learn easy to read Braille we're, we're going to hear from Sila um, the Center for Equitable Library Access in a little while and from them and from other sources I've received um, high um, high interest low vocabulary books that are easy to read um, you know, uh, you're going to be at different stages and you're going to plateau, you'll make progress and then, oh, I'm stuck. So that's kind of, you know, where I am. And, you know, don't be frustrated. And again, there's people around you who can help you. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Awesome. Um, Ioana, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have advice for a new Braille? I know you're also a longtime Braille user, but what would you tell people that are thinking about it? Or what would you even tell family members or people related to people that are cited about learning, learning Braille maybe? I think, um, well, one of the, the important things that um, has helped me, I find that I've been a long time Braille user, but I've used Braille in stages. So every once in a while I rediscover it. And speaking of plateaus, every once in a while you hear something that just inspires you to push your skills further. And that's so, so um, for example, for me, it was hearing people read so fluently and beautifully in Braille. And I was like uh, out loud stories. And I thought I, I didn't push my skills to that level. So I, it inspired me to do that. 
Um, a tip that I planned on mentioning uh, when I will talk about Sila is the if you have the possibility to read in Braille while listening to the text, and you can either maybe read with somebody that can read the text with you slowly at your speed, or there are other ways to slow down if you're listening to an audiobook or um, a speech, a speech synthesized book, and you can slow that down quite a bit. And so make, make, make use of technology and uh, use this ability of hearing what you are reading in Braille at the same time that I find that can help you um, stay focused and maybe sometimes nudge your reading speed for forward. Um, about other people supporting, uh, I think Natalie did such a brilliant job. I wouldn't know how what to say, but I know that my parents, they learned Braille, my sister learned Braille, and it's a, it's a nice uh, feeling in school. One of my best friends learned Braille and these small gestures make a big difference for, um, for people, Braille readers to feel accepted, supported, um, integrated in the world around them. Absolutely. And my mom also learned Braille. And so she Brailled everything, all the gifts and cards. And I've had several friends that still use send me Braille cards. And it, it's really, really appreciated. It really makes me feel particularly cared about. Not that other ones don't, but you know, if you can read it easily yourself, it just means a lot to us for sure. Um, Shelly, what have you done around your house to make sure or around your house or your workplace to make sure that you have a lot of braille there to um to to practice with well i'm laughing because i'm still having this problem where my braille labels keep flying off <laughs> which isn't very helpful we're still working on that one um i have actually just for fun and games i've actually put my braille alphabet on the mirror in my bathroom and I do practice it. I'm really good with that. I have used, somebody mentioned, I think it was Natalie, maybe it was Daphne mentioning about tactile markers on things. I've always done tactile markers on different things, but maybe now I can actually put letters on things which are really good. So um, I should probably be using it a bit more around the house as such. I, I still, you know, I shouldn't say I still, but I do have sight, but you know, again, it was mentioned earlier that there are sometimes you'll get a couple of cans in your in your cupboard. They're very similar, uh, but they're very different. And that would be very, very helpful even to stick some letters uh, on there, you know, shampoo and uh, conditioner. I think that was another one that was mentioned, too, because when you're in the shower, you don't have your glasses on. And if you're low vision, you really don't see, especially if the bottles are the same color. Um so around the house, I'm still kind of working on that one. Um, and, um, you know, I, I can talk a little bit later about how I've sort of gone a little beyond my house when, when we come to that. But I'm still developing ways to make my house tactile, um, you know, and to label more and more things as we go. So I'm wondering, Daphne, do you have tips about what people can label like around them to any other tips? Perhaps as a long time, long term teacher with visually impaired and <laughs> braille enthusiast, do you have any um, ideas for what people can get their hands on um, easily and what might, besides what we've said already, I guess a lot of things, but any tips there? Yeah, thanks, Kim. So um, when I was working in the school system, and I would encourage parents to start railing up their home, some of the things that we we did were thinking about where you always go and thinking about your routines. So if one of your routines is going to the fridge to grab that jug of milk every day or going to the fridge to pull out that wedge of cheese, putting a braille label on the fridge right there. And it might be the word fridge. It might be something that you want to have sort of a focus of a braille character that you're really struggling with. So maybe it's the, it's the letter T, for instance, and you just really want to keep practicing that letter T because it's, it's driving you nuts, you can't get it. Put it on the fridge because you know you're going to go to the fridge every day to pull <laughs> something out there. Another place that you can add in Braille is every, all of us sit down to eat. And having Braille at the table, we, I suggested to 
parents that they put it on their uh, placemat. So the placemat not only provided for the child a, a, a defined area where they could find their, their food, but it also gave them that opportunity to have their hands on Braille, even when they weren't even thinking about it because that placemat was there. Another uh, place, if you are using your microwave on a regular basis, as Natalie mentioned, put a dot on there. Um, I'm gonna put a plug in here for a little thing called Braille Bites. During the, if you search it on, on uh, social media and search up Braille, short, uh, Braille Shorts, you'll come across a quick little video on how to put tactile markers on your microwave. And I can't stress that enough. It is so helpful to be able to um, go to those, go when you're going to the microwave to be able to do that, all those function keys independently because you've got the tactile markers there. Um, think, I just can't stress enough. Think about your routines. Think about where you're going to be every day that you know you're going to be sitting. You know that you're going to be um, having a few minutes to yourself. And, um, and go and put your braille where you're going to be. Um, it, it, it does take time. And I, one thing that if you have someone in your home who is sighted, who is interested in learning braille with you, ask them to put up a braille sheet sheet on the fridge or, or on the kitchen wall where you sit, near where you sit. And on that braille sheet sheet, sheet would be all the braille characters and so they can say to you okay let's do it we're going to do dots you know uh four <laughs> five what or, or, or excuse me um i'm i'm jumping ahead of myself dots dots one four five what is what letter is that oh yeah right it's letter it's letter d okay let's go jump down and we're going to do dots one three what's that oh right letter k and so make a game of it you know learn together and as Shelley so rightly pointed out, don't be hard on yourself. T learning takes time and practice and you can do it. Anyways, that was a long-winded answer. Sorry, Kim. No, no, it's fine. It It is getting close to uh, two and I wanted to make sure that Ioana has lots of time. So maybe I could let Ioana talk about resources and then we could do Q&A and we, we can always ask Shelley and others and, and everyone can ask Shelley more questions. I just want to make sure we get all the things in and the resources and also the time for the Q&A. So um, thank you, Shelley, for those great answers and, and Natalie and Iwana and Daphne as well. Um, I just really encourage everyone to learn at least a little bit of Braille so you don't get stuck in an elevator or go in the wrong bathroom if for, no, if for nothing else. <laughs> uh, but thank you. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Iwana and whoever else is presenting from Sila at this moment. And uh, and and thank you, thank you so much for your candid answers and your great tips and your love and enthusiasm for Braille and for my Christmas tea that was all labeled beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Kim, and thanks everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of Sila and uh, sharing um, all sorts of resources that hopefully will help you in your journey with uh, Braille and. Um, so I will start with uh, resources of places where you can purchase Braille related materials. The first one is uh, American Printing House for the Blind, APH.org. And they have all sorts of products. Um, they are also well known for Braille related technology. So they have uh, all sorts of, uh, they have various Braille displays. Um, and Natalie showed you one in her part of the presentation. So. And you have catalogs that you can download and uh, look at all their various Braille related products. Next up is uh, National Braille Press that we also mentioned today. Um, and they have all sorts of Braille um, products for various interests and levels of Braille usage. And among them, for example, Braille calendars or uh, Braille a world, a word puzzles for adults, they even have Sudoku. So um, you could go with Braille in so many interesting ways. Um, next up is seedling.org. Um, that is a place where you can buy print Braille books and print Braille, just as a reminder, we mentioned them before, 
but these are dual media books, books that are picture books for children, and you can purchase them here at uh, this uh, place. Uh, so th they have also braille imprint in the same book, so you can read along with sight uh, with uh, print readers and Braille users can read together. Um, the Braille bookstore, that is um, another great uh, place where they also on their website, they have an education corner. And that is a great place to start exploring their offerings for getting started with Braille. They have flashcards, uh, reference sheets for the alphabet. Um, and uh, tactile puzzles, I think, to help you understand Braille. So uh, I think that could be an interesting place to start exploring um, in getting started with Braille. Um, and now I wanted to finish the resource list by presenting the last two resources. They are not for purchasing, but rather here is where you can uh, borrow materials. And these are um, CELA, the CELA library and NELS, and I will be talking in more detail about both of these in uh, the following slides. Um, finally, also there is an, a notable addition to all these resources is the fact that um, the Braille Literacy Canada has a resource page where you can see listed all sorts of Braille related uh, information. Uh, many of them are I just mentioned here, but there are many more that I will not cover in this presentation because otherwise we'll be here tomorrow. Um, so let's go to the next slide, which is about CELA Library. What is CELA? It's, it's the Center for Equitable Library Access, and it's a nonprofit organization that offers over 1 million books and uh, titles, uh, like such as uh, magazines and uh, newspapers, uh, in accessible formats. So this is not just Braille, but other accessible formats. We also uh, at CELA offer access to the Bookshare collection. And this is a collection, a US collection of accessible um, books. And um, so it's very nice that you can access all of those through the CELA interface. Um, Braille, what was, let's talk more about Braille specifically offered at CELA. We have over uh, 11,000 books, magazines for all ages and interests. And um, these are in uh, the UEB, so that's the uh, Unified English Braille, and both in contracted Braille and uncontracted Braille. I'm assuming that for definitely for the first steps, we will look at the uncontracted, but there are options for everybody. Um, this is mostly the Braille in uh, at CELA is mostly human transcribed. That means uh, that there are actually Braille experts transcribing the, the books. However, there are the automatically transcribed books that are available through Bookshare, and they make all their EPUB or e-text, electronic texts, available also in Braille. Now, um, a quick note about Bookshare, you do need to provide, if you want to have access through CELA to the Bookshare collection in the US, you need to provide a proof of disability. So you don't automatically have access just because you're a CELA member. Um, we have different ways of delivering Braille, the physical embossed Braille formats, and they are delivered um, in uh, boxes to the users. And the nice thing is that you can keep them um, and you don't need to return them. Then, of course, there is the alternate format, the eBraille, so the electronic format, and you can download these on various devices and use a Braille display to uh, read them in Braille. Um, we have also the print, <clears throat> the print Braille collection, over 1,400 books, picture books for children. Uh, some of them I think you could purchase uh, in the previously mentioned resources, but here you can borrow them. And these indeed, you need, they are in uncontracted Braille and they do need to be returned to us, to CELA. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, alternative formats or to Braille. So CELA offers books in audio format and also in accessible e-text. And uh, both of these, as I mentioned a little bit before, can be an interesting option because you can borrow the same book 
as a braille version, but also listen to the audio book or the audio content. And I personally, even although I've been using braille all my life, I love to use this and try to put the uh, speed of the player because you, uh, with most uh, applications, whatever your technology is, you can control the playback speed. And I put it just at the limit of my current reading speed and try to push it a little bit ahead. Um, so it's an interesting way to read. And also it might make it a little easier to read because you don't have to decipher every word. So it might encourage you to read for, read for longer periods of time. Um, so where does the Braille come from, from uh, Sila? We have um, mostly from CNIB Beyond Print. They are transcribing the, uh, the human transcribed portion of the Braille. We also have through the great Marrakesh Treaty that ensures that we can exchange files with international partners. And um, one of some of the great additions to our partners, now we're happy to that they are part of the Marrakesh file exchange program with SILA, our NLS. And in for French speaking, for people that are looking for Braille in French, uh, it's the BANQ, Le Bibliothèque et Archive Nationale du Québec. And um, a note about Quebec uh, residents, if you live in Quebec, then the Braille that comes from the BNQ, you will access it through that organization directly rather than through CELA. But everywhere else, CELA will make French Braille available to you um, in, thanks to this collaboration. Let's move on to NELS. And this is another great option for um, borrowing Braille. And there are a few ways to access Braille from NELS. The physical um, Braille can be accessed through public libraries. So you go to your public library and they access the print Braille through interlibrary loans. And uh, then there is a digital option. So you can directly from the page of uh, NELS, you can uh, download uh, Braille and read it on your Braille display. All Braille from NELS is human transcribed. And uh, we offer, they offer in contracted and uncontracted Braille, both English and French. And um, with this, the Braille comes from collaborating with uh, publishers to make sure that the Braille and print are released at the same time, which I think is such a nice idea because so often we have to wait a long time until uh, the, some interesting book becomes available in Braille. And, uh, the Nels collection includes uh, uh, poetry, plot your, own, plot your own story, young adult, adult, fiction, nonfiction, recipes, uh, print braille, tactile graphics. So that's very interesting for STEM or for um, maps and things like that, and more. Um, so user can also request um, titles to be produced in, in braille which is nice to know because sometimes we don't need to resign ourselves if something is not available, but it's always nice to explore options to request that a title be produced. And uh, Sila has options for that too. Um, they have a nice page about uh, with information about braille displays because it can be a bit daunting to choose which braille display is right for you, the various sizes, models, and uh, so you can find Ref, um, references about such things on the NELS website. And um, you can also um, find more information about, in general, their, all their Braille related uh, projects, Braille and tactile um, projects on the web page of, of NELS. Yes, yeah, so that will be in a nutshell the two libraries. I wanted to finish with the last slide about your role that you can play in advocating for Braille um, by connecting with your public library, because this way your journey will be amplified. You will be given a stronger voice. You, it will not, and they also can support you in your journey and you will help amplify the, the voice of Braille users around. So Braille, uh, public libraries can borrow or download um, eBraille for you. So. You don't necessarily have to do it directly. Some people might prefer to just take a trip to the public library or help have them be the intermediary. Um, 
and like I was saying, this can raise um, implicating your library will help raise awareness in your larger community about Braille. So you have to like this. This way would be great if you can encourage staff in the library to be aware about the Braille options that the library can offer. Um, you know, they can also put uh, Braille signage in the libraries, like we were mentioning, all the elevators, bathrooms, or you know, you know, different counters or. Uh, they can also label the, the audiobooks that you might order on CDs or the DVDs with movies, especially those that have audio descriptions. Uh, so these are all ways that you can encourage or ask for those things. Like I think Natalie was mentioning, uh, don't be shy to ask around in your community about uh, Braille options for menus. And in this particular case, all the library related services. There is also um, a great way to uh, encourage libraries if they don't already do it to uh, in include to to host um, inclusive activities where you can participate such as in accessible book clubs and you can be uh, use them as a motivator if reading is something you like to do um, you can be part of a community and uh, be motivated to read and braille the next book club book and um, Yes, I hope this gives you a sense of uh, um, of the things you can do. Of course, you can en encourage libraries. Another way that they could can help. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, the, the the beautiful thing is that if you, they the libraries hire people with lived experience, then they uh, that there is a, another they can serve as role models and they can help shift perceptions of people around uh, Braille and uh, vision loss in general. Uh, and I want to point out the great uh, resource of accessiblelibraries.ca, which gives all sorts of information uh, in, about ways in which uh, libraries can make their services accessible if they already don't do it. So I hope that these are a few ideas. And I know that this is a lot of information, but uh, the PowerPoint will be made available to you and the recording you can go back to it and revisit things that you were interested in. But I hope this gives you ideas or places to go to, um, to get started in your Braille journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ioana, and thank you, everybody.